Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you for your attendance. And I'm here for a uh, co-moderate this webinar organized by Ifim Young Internist with the title Challenges in the Diagnosis and Management of Systemic Lupus Erythematosus. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Ibar Spickens for uh, the Department of Internal Diseases from Riga Stradinus University in Latvia. And I'm Lucia Barrera, an internal medicine specialist from the Northwest of Spain. So uh, before we present our, our great speaker, uh, I want to say to you that we encourage an active participation with questions and comments from the audience. Uh, all the presentation, uh, all the questions in the presentation will be collected and you can write it down in the chat and in the end we will ask uh, the professor uh, the question and then uh, he will ask the answers and uh, this video will be available in the, in the YouTube channel of uh, Ifim Jung Internist after the webinar so um, it's the time for my colleague uh, for presenting the speaker. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining also this web webinar. It's my great honor to also introduce Professor Laurent Arnaud. He is a professor of rheumatology of Strasbourg University and academic hospitals from France. His main clinical interests focus on the care of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. He is leading a research group focusing on innovating strategies to study the epidemiology of autoimmune diseases with a particularly particular interest for the use of novel diagnostic and therapeutic uh, clinical strategies based on big data and artificial intelligence. With his team at the French National Reference Center for Rare Autoimmune Diseases of Strasbourg, he has contributed to more than 200 research projects in the field of rare diseases. Professor Arnaud is the president of Lupus European Lupus Society and Disease Coordinator for Lupus and Relapsing Polychondritis of the European Reference Network for Rare Diseases Reconnect. He is the curator for a Twitter account at Lupus Reference about lupus education, fellow followed by more than 12,000 people. So thank you, Professor, also for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Ivash. It's really good to see you. Uh, hello to Katarina also. And uh, well, I'm super, super happy to be here. Very, very excited. Uh, this is a unique opportunity to talk about Blue Voice. So uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to, to share my screen. Uh, just one. Uh, uh, is this okay? Can you see yes. the full screen? Perfect. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So just in case something goes wrong, you just tell me. But I just want to start with my disclosures. I'm not going to talk too much about new treatments, but just in case, these are my disclosures. And if you do not follow me on Twitter, uh, what are you waiting for? You will be uh, very happy, make me very happy. Um, so I, I work in Strasbourg, and just in case you don't know where it is, it is in the northeast of France. We are one kilometer away from the German border. And if you have not been there yet, it's a very, very beautiful city. So you are very, very invited to join us in Strasbourg. So I'm going to talk not about Strasbourg, but about lupus, the, the wolf in Latin. And uh, I just wanted to start with a very general um, feedback on, on the disease. I think everybody knows it's an autoimmune disease. It has many systemic manifestations. What is very typical, I'll come back to that later, is that we have autoantibodies against uh, nuclear antigens. And you know that there's a very strong female predominance, especially in young women. The mean age at diagnosis in Europe is around 30 years. So today I'm going to talk about SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. But you already know that there are other types of lupus. Um, one is CLE purely cutaneous lupus, only the skin has lesions, but there are other forms. I'm thinking about neonatal lupus in patients with SSA antibodies. I'm also thinking about drug-induced lupus. I'll come back to that in a minute. And because the, the word lupus comes from the middle age, there are other diseases which contains the word lupus, but are not lupus in the modern sense. 
is lupus spermio, is sarcoidosis, and lupus vulgaris, which is tuberculosis of the skin. So really, this is a very heterogeneous family of, uh, of diseases. And I, I'd like to tell you about a case, actually, uh, a patient named Sophia. She's 26 years old, and she is the head of social media in a very famous company called Lugo. Uh, and the problem she has is that for the last three months, she has had pain, inflammatory pain in the hands. She also has a rash on the face, but the rash is not new. And all this is very bothering at work. And because she's working at Lugo, she's super smart and she has already searched young woman, inflammatory pain and rash. And she thinks she comes to your consultation thinking it could be lupus. And that is really amazing because we know there is a big problem with rare autoimmune diseases is the diagnosis delay between the first symptom, what we will call early SLE, and the diagnosis, many years can be there. And actually, we have the data for, for uh, Europe. This is an amazing survey that was done by the, the patient association Lupus Europe. As you can see, there are more than 4,000 respondents in 35 countries. And the median diagnosis delay is two years. So it's much improved compared to before. But yet, this is a very long delay, and we understand the true pain and sufferance of some of the patients waiting for a diagnosis of SLE. So how do we actually make a diagnosis of SLE? Well, first, we need some clinical manifestations which are compatible with the diagnosis. And when you look at the frequency of these manifestations, they may vary a bit across the studies. Uh, these are the data from the European uh, cohort by Ricard Cervera. There are more than 1,000 lupus patients. And you can see that the number one manifestation is arthritis, joint involvement. And the second one manifestation is actually malheur rash. And this is precisely what our patient is coming at the consultation with, arthritis and malheur rash. So I have just made for you a little list of what I think are my top situations for thinking about lupus. I think there are two big problems here. Either people do not think about lupus, so that there is diagnosis delay. Either they think too much about lupus and there is excessive delay. So I'll come back to that later, but I want to underline the point number 10, which is the typical manifestations when we as internists or rheumatologists are confronted to very diverse manifestations, the typical manifestations, I think we have to think of systemic lupus and perform a search for anti-nuclear antibodies. Because we know that the second step to make a diagnosis of lupus is to find, to show the presence of SLE-related autoantibodies. And a very important clinical message, and this comes back all the time at the consultation is that these anti-nuclear antibodies, they are usually there before the diagnosis. So when you suspect lupus and you have no anti-nuclear antibodies, this is a strong element against the diagnosis. Of course, it can be a technical problem. The sensitivity of the kits used in the different labs are not perfect. So you must search dedicated antibodies, specifically if you have a high suspicion, but usually speaking, no ANA is a strong element against the diagnosis of SLE. And actually, this is a big, big problem for general practitioners. Uh, we did a very nice survey uh, asking patients, asking doctors, where were the problems in the diagnosis pathway? And what you can see is that many people, many general physicians, were confused about the indication for anti-nuclear antibody testing, but also about what to do in case of positivity. In many departments, there are no dedicated consultation for that. The patients have to, to wait quite a long time to see an internist. And I think this is something we can really work on and improve. And I just wanted to give you this reference because I think it's a super nice website just in case you are curious about the antibody pattern or you hear about a new antibody, you can go on this website 
is anapatterns.org, and you will get all the details about the different fluorescence, the targets, and so on. This is an amazing website. So check it. You will not be disappointed. So let's look at our patient. And when you look at the results, actually, you see that she has very high ANA titers, more than one in 1,280. And she also has very elevated anti-DSDNA antibodies, which is very, very typical for SLE. So she has manifestations compatible with SLE. She has SLE-related autoantibodies. So it really looks like SLE, but we need to rule out differential diagnosis. And this is something that is very, very key in systemic lupus. A patient may report a symptom, and as a young internist, you will have to decide whether the symptom is attributed to lupus or whether it is due to something else. And this is absolutely key. And for what we now call type one manifestations, objective manifestations, a malar rash, you can see it. Arthritis, it's swollen, you can see it. It's quite easy. It is way more complicated when you're dealing with type two symptoms, which are basically subjective manifestations, depression, fatigue, brain fog, which is very common, or even pain. Pain is a very subjective experience. And a patient reported pain with a normal clinical examination is always a challenge for young internists and for senior internists, actually. So this patient, as I said, she has malar rash. And I think it's important to know that in the newest classification system, we are not talking so much about malar rash anymore because malar rash is a topographical diagnosis. It is not an explanation for what you see. In most cases, we are talking about acute lupus malar rash. But I'm sure you know that other subtypes of cutaneous lupus can give you a malar rash. This is the case for subacute lupus. This is also the case for discoid lupus and also tumidus. So it's important to know what we're talking about. And in the latest classification, malar rash should be understood in the, in the sense of acute lupus malar rash. And this is where we can have small surprise. You know that among the most common mimickers of lupus, there are the cutaneous mimickers. I'm just showing you the, these pictures. I see maybe 20, 50 patients every year at the consultation because there is a malar rash. And I'm sure you know the diagnosis. This is not lupus. This is, you are correct, this is rosacea. Rosacea is very, very common. And I think any young internist has to know how to make the difference. I'll give you three secrets. First, rosacea is strictly limited to the face. It can be also on the eyes, but it's on the face. If the lesions are elsewhere, then it, it probably is something else. Second, it is very typical for rosacea to have papules and pustules. This is not common in SLE, with a little exception, which is corticosteroid-induced apnea. But SLE itself is very rarely showing in a pustulous form. If there is a doubt, you can always make a skin biopsy. But papules and pustules are very typical for, from, for rosacea. And the third secret is the flush. Lupus is not flushing. Rosacea is very commonly flushing. So I'm asking the patient, when you have an emotion, do you have a flush? Or when you drink a glass of champagne, do you have a, a flush? And also rosacea is very, very common, is up to three to 5% of the population. So statistically speaking, a malarash is going to be rosacea instead of lupus. And so this patient, she's flushing a lot and she has lesions typical of rosacea. So we actually ruled out this important differential diagnosis. Now, I want to say a word about uh, joint involvement because there's a bit of novelty. First, it's important to know that arthritis, swollen joints, will be seen in only one third of patients. So it is very common to have true lupus patient co coming with only joint pain. What I mean by only is that 
there is nothing to see on the clinical examination. Of course, this is a very important and very bothering manifestation. It gives a loss of work, so this is to be diagnosed properly. And it's good to know that in a huge majority of cases, the diagnosis you will make is called NDME, is non-deforming, non-erosive arthropathy. You need to do the radiographs of the hand, of course, but Jakku is only three to five percent, and lupus, the overlap between rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, is quite rare. So a huge majority of patients have inflammatory pain and not arthritis. It can be a bit confusing. So can we perform ultrasound? You know that ultrasound is really coming to internal medicine. So I think it's interesting to know what it can bring. And well, I already said that one third of patients will have clinical synovitis and that two third of patients with inflammatory pain, there will be nothing to see. Sometimes you want to be sure there is something underneath. And this is where ultrasound is interesting. In that case, when you have non-clinical synovitis, inflammatory pain, and you perform an ultrasound, 50% of the patients you will have some inflammatory changes in the joint. So it is a very good way to legitimate what is reported as inflammatory pain, if you want to be sure. So in the end, we made a diagnosis of SLE based on arthritis, anti-DSDNA, and we ruled out a cutaneous mimica. So what could it be? It is obviously systemic lupus. I think you notice we did not use the criteria. Criteria are classification criteria. They are not made to make a diagnosis. They are just made to make homogeneous groups of patients for research, for studies, or for trial. So the difference is very important. We do not have diagnosis criteria for lupus. But if you want to apply them, just to double check, you can. First, there is an entry criteria. You need ANA. And our patient, this patient had positive ANA testing. Second, she has arthritis is six points, and she has DSDNA antibodies is six points. So she has points from the clinical domain and from the immunological domain, and you need both. And you need 10 points, and she has 12 points. So she is classified as a patient with SLE. And I must say, this is not the way to use these classification criteria. But just in case, if you want to compare the ability to make diagnosis, it performs very well. Sensitivity and specificity is very high. And what is really important is that it's been proven to be very sensitive and specific for the diagnosis, whatever is the gender, whatever is disease duration, meaning also in early lupus and across many different ethnic backgrounds. So these criteria should not be used for diagnosis, but in case you want to double check, they perform well. Is there anything new, especially for the diagnosis in the context of big data, artificial intelligence? Yes, there is. First paper I just want to quote is a Chinese app based on artificial intelligence to classify skin, skin lesions as lupus or not lupus. It performs very well. I'm sure you know that intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence works very well for classification of images. It does as well as expert dermatologists. Maybe it will arrive in the next years, but I don't have it in my smartphone yet. Second thing, can we detect patients with lupus when they come to the emergency room several times based on their manifestation? The answer is yet is yes. This is a nice ARD paper showing that the more manifestations of lupus, the higher is the probability to have lupus. This is quite expected in a way, but it shows that we can deploy that kind of analysis in databases to detect patients as, as early as we, as we can. So this is for the general consideration for the diagnosis. I would like to... to tell you about two specific situations. The first one is drug-induced lupus. There are around 120 different drugs that can induce systemic lupus. And as you can see, 
the female predominance is less marked than in SLE. And also, patients with drug-induced lupus are generally a bit older than patients with SLE. But it, it's something to really consider. The way I do it is that every time I am confronted to a, a typical lupus, meaning lupus in a male patient or late onset lupus, I always review the list of drugs. I always do it also in case of subacute cutaneous lupus, because many drugs can be inducing cutaneous only lupus. So this is an important step in the diagnosis strategy. Review the list of drugs. The second point I'd like to discuss is that some patients will have purely cutaneous lupus erythematosus, and some of these patients may progress to SLE, especially severe SLE. So it's really important for our colleagues from dermatology to know who is going to progress to SLE when patients have severe um, um, discoid lupus. And so there's a very recent and very beautiful paper by uh, the team of Francois Chasset in Paris showing that when discoid lupus is very early, when you have a dark phototype, or when you have strong and high ANA titers, the risk of progressing from CLE to severe SLE is high, and maybe this patient should be followed in conjunction with internist, and maybe not only by dermatologists. Now, our patient, she's clever. She knows she has the diagnosis, and she wants to know more about the goal of treatment. So I'm asking you, what do you think is the main goal of treatment in SLE? I'm sure you know the answer. But I'm going to give you a hint. We now go through something called treat to target. We set a target, we treat to reach the target, we check if the target is reached. If it's reached, we're happy. And if it is not reached, we increase the therapeutic pressure and we check again. And the target is remission. This is the EULA recommendation. Management of SLE should aim at remission of disease symptoms and signs. This is what is really important. And the reason why is that reaching remission has been associated with lots of benefits that are shown here. It even lowers the risk of death. It lowers the risk of damage. It helps decreasing corticosteroid. So this is absolutely crucial. So what is remission? Well, it's not new. It's been at least 15 years, lots of studies about remission. Everybody has a different proposal. So I'm very privileged. I belong to this international group led by Ronald van Pollenhoven. We've been working for five years on a new definition of remission in SLE. And this is this definition, is a combination of four elements. And I'm going to go into the details. And I'm not going to be a very nice guy. This is a group work, but as an individual, I'm okay to say that I do not agree with everything. First, we need a clinical sleep eye of zero, meaning no clinical activity. Just want to remind you that routine lab, cytopenia, renal domain, this in lupus belongs to clinical domain. You can say, oh, it's not clinic, it's laboratory. But in lupus, laboratory, routine laboratory is clinic. Something different is immunological domain, serology. That's something else. But clinical domain includes cytopenia and renal domain. And in daily life, how do we assess this activity? Well, it's very different from routine than from research and trial. In routine care, is recommended to use validated index. But to be honest, nobody does that for routine care. I do not do PGA and sleep eye for the day-to-day -day care of patients. I do it for research. What we do in routine care is that we just do clinical assessment. How many swollen joints? How many tender joints? What are the routine laboratory tests? How is the complement? How is the DSDNA antibodies? For research and trial, it's very different because we use scores, but the scores for daily practice, they are very useless, I think. I'm not going to open the door of a fight between the different scores. You have the slide eye, you have the bilag, 
you have other scores, many of them, all of them have different properties. I just want to say that the SLIDA is not perfect. You can have a clinical SLIDA of zero and a severe case of lupus enteritis because these kind of manifestations are not captured. It is said vasculitis, but I want to remind you that not all cases of lupus enteritis qualify as vasculitis. The second element is the PGA, the Physician Global Assessment. Basically, you as a doctor, as an internist, you have to decide which level of disease activity is the patient having on a zero to three scale. I'm sure you know what I'm going to tell you. We have shown this with uh, Matteo Piga and Elisabetta Taquesa. It is valid, but there is a very high variability. Uh, if I ask any of you to rate, we are going to have different answers. So uh, with Matteo, we've been privileged enough to, to lead an international exercise to standardize the PGA in lupus. It is published in the Lancet Rheumatology. You can have a look at the paper if you wish. Um, but my, my idea is that I think we should not use the PGA. It is not a good instrument. Also, it does not correlate well with the per patient perception. This is something we showed at EULA. You have the patient writing, you have the doctor's writing. Look at this cloud. The correlation is very poor. Also, uh, our colleague from Padua, El Professor Andrea Doria, has shown that you can remove the PGA from the definition of remission and it doesn't change anything. So to be honest, I don't think the PGA is really needed in this definition. What we need is low level of prednisone, maximum five milligram. And I want to show you something. I think a few months ago, I, I made a little uh, survey on my Twitter account what is the goal of treatment? And you can see that some people said no clinical activity, but this is not okay because you can have no clinical activity because you receive 60 milligram of prednisone and this is not remission. So we have to make a big difference between no clinical activity and no clinical activity and low dose prednisone. And that is the definition of remission. And actually in lupus, we have robust data showing that when you use more than five milligrams a day of prednisone on a long-term basis, you accrue independent damage due to corticosteroid. So our target should be a maximum of five milligrams. And I am happy to show you this recommendation by EULA. What is recommended is to minimize less than 7.5 I don't think this is a good recommendation. And most of my colleagues will agree that our maximum amount should be five milligrams. And of course, we need stable treatment. If you are increasing the treatment, it's not going to be remission. What is a bit sad in SLE is that the probability to reach remission is actually quite low. The numbers are quite high in the first paper, but when you look down, the paper from Manuel Urgatigi uh, from Peru is 1.1% of 2,000 patients. So it is actually difficult to reach remission. The plan A is difficult to reach. We need a plan B. And the plan B is low disease activity. I'm not going to go too much into the details today because it's quite technical. This is called the LLDAS, Lupus Low Disease Activity State. It was derived by Eric Moran from Australia and his group. For me, this is interesting, but this is a plan B. The only plan A we should be looking for is remission. So if you want to apply treat to target in SLE, this is what we are going to get. We have the diagnosis, this is active. You're going to treat and to target remission. And only if you cannot reach remission, you will accept a LLDAS, which has to be sustained. Otherwise, it's not good enough. I have to say a word about pregnancy. Uh, this is a list of big challenge we have in SLE. And because this is mostly a disease of young women, pregnancy is a big, big challenge. 
And I like to quote this study because it's a nationwide population-based study from Korea, which is a very developed country. What you can see there is that the likelihood of problems during pregnancy remains high in SLE. So you really need to know how to manage pregnancy in SLE. I think the main thing to keep in mind is that the disease should not be active in the previous months. But then today we see new concepts within remission and we have seen LLDAS. Which one is okay to start the pregnancy? Well, this is very important. We don't have many papers about that, but this is a great paper from Karatani from the Reconet and PISA group. Almost 400 pregnancies. Remission is strictly needed to start pregnancy in good conditions. If you start the pregnancy in LLDAS, low disease activity state, not being in remission, you multiply by three the likelihood of adverse event during the pregnancy. So very important message. We need remission to start pregnancy in a good way. Let's move on to the treatments. What kind of treatments do we have in mind? Well, over the years, you know that there have been many, many changes in the therapeutic strategy of SLE. And actually, we have many updates. Between last year and this year, there are three new approvals or extension of indication for the treatment of SLE. So lots of great changes. I'm not going to review everything in detail, but I want to give you practical and important message. And for that, I'd like to start with hydroxychloroquine. You know it controls disease activity, prevents less. It has amazing properties. But we need to do better. Only around 80% of patients receive hydroxychloroquine. And a very important message is that it can be started very safely for the heart at the dose we used in internal medicine. Uh, patients may be very worried because they, they've used, they've heard of the COVID studies with death by arrhythmia. But in lupus, in internal medicine, the doses we use are good doses that are not um, giving some arrhythmia. You know that the risk of retinopathy, but the risk of retinopathy, when you look at the most recent studies, is actually quite limited. It's just a few percent at 10 years. And I hope you have seen this paper. It's one of the most important paper. If you use too low doses of hydroxychloroquine, less than five milligram per kilogram per day, you increase the risk of flare. So it's a trade-off between increasing the risk of flare and having less eye toxicity or using high doses. This is what we do in France. We use 400 milligrams. There is less risk of flare, but there is a higher risk of toxicity for the eye, but it remains quite low. So I think this is what I choose. And if you have a doubt, you can always measure hydroxychloroquine blood concentrations, although it is not available everywhere. So am I going to take HCQ all my life? When a patient is asking me about, shall I stop the treatment? I'm always very worried about therapeutic adherence. We know from patient survey that only around 70% of patients are going to use the treatments properly. So I have this little uh, graph I prepared before and I'm showing to the patient at the consultation. I think it is quite clear. This is what happens when you stop the treatment. Yet we need to find ways to stop these treatments. And I'm just showing you a survey. When the disease gets in remission, 50% of physicians will reduce the dose of hydroxychloroquine. And actually there's a very nice paper published last year showing that if you do that, after one year of remission, you multiply by two to three the risk of flare. So my recommendation is to wait a bit longer to start to decrease hydroxychloroquine. I want to say quick words about corticosteroids. Time flies, we know there are amazing properties and we know there are bad side effects. So we need to use less. And it's interesting to know that EULA is recommending the use of pulses of prednisone because it could trigger some kind of non-genomic effects and enable the use of a lower dose of oral corticosteroids. But we have no proof for that. 
the data, these are amazing data from Spain, actually, the Guillermo Ricirastosa from Bilbao. But this is a retrospective comparison between two different cities, Bordeaux and Cruces. So uh, this is not robust evidence. I think what is important is to use no more than 0 0.5 milligram kilogram of prednisone for the induction, except in severe cases, of course. If you're in the ICU, you can use more. Um, what is recommended by you now is even lower doses, 0 0.3 milligram kilogram for lupus nephritis. I don't think people will agree. There is one small randomized control trial showing that 0 0.5 is okay, but there are quite a lot of data showing that if you go too low, this is the blue line, well, the proportion of complete renal response also gets down. So I think it's great to use less corticosteroids, but maybe not too low. And this is why people actually do not follow this recommendation by EULA. You see that for lupus nephritis, a huge majority of people still use high doses. What about the dose we can use on a long-term basis? Recommendation 7.5, I'll be brief. I do not believe this is correct. No more than five milligram should be tried to be achieved. What happens when the patient reaches five? Can she stop corticosteroid? I am sure you have heard about this randomized controlled trial published in ARD. Patient in which you stop five milligrams of corticosteroid, they will have more flares. Well, five milligrams of corticosteroid is an active dose. And if you stop abruptly, such as in this paper, of course you have more flares. But if you do progressive tapering, we have good data showing that it is doable. You can stop corticosteroid. And in case you don't believe this first paper, there is again, some beautiful data from the Italian registry. This is also from Floris and Matteo Piga. Very great work. Yes, we can stop corticosteroids in lupus. What's the space for conventional immunosuppressive treatment? I'll be very brief because there is no novelty. I'm sure you know the indication of these different treatments. I can just say that cyclophosphamide, especially high dose, is not used anymore or very not common. And we need new treatments because these conventional treatments, they work, but the result is not amazing. So, well, we had new treatments and that is great news. Uh, you have seen, I think, the results of the Bliss LN study, Belimumab in lupus nephritis. This is very new. You have probably seen the results of Voclosporin. It sounds like cyclosporin in lupus nephritis. Beautiful effect. But it is a bit unclear when to use these drugs. Some patients will say from the start. Some people will say from the start when you have some severe manifestations and some physicians will tell you only in case of refractory form. So nobody really agrees, but this is going to be updated in the next months and I'm sure we'll have some new uh, feedback from the ERA and from the EULA. I also want to quote an Ifrolumab the blocker of the receptor of interferons type 1, because you've seen the great papers. Uh, this is very powerful. But phase 2 study does not show that it is a, an achievable or an achieved endpoint in the phase 2 study for lupus nephritis. So I have just summarized the potential indications for these new treatments are on the slide. I think it's great to keep this little summary in the pocket. Um, and just remember that voclosprine has been tried in lupus nephritis, but it is not approved for other types of lupus, actually. We need new drugs. This is great, but we need new drugs. And you know that developing new drugs in SLE is not an easy ride. 25 drugs have failed in phase two or phase three. This is very sad. 25 drugs. So can we do other things? Well, I'm sure you've been asked before about CAR T cells because there's a huge paper in the New England this year. And well, this is interesting. You can target CD19 and this cell, they can proliferate, they can go to the tissue. So this may be a treatment for the future, but for now is only for refractory cases. So what are you going to give to this patient for her joints? 
Well, this is a summary, a kind of recap for all the indications. And I just wanted to remind you that we need some general measures. I'll come back to that in a minute. We need some background treatment with hydroxychloroquine for all patients. And then the specific therapeutic strategy has to be discussed with the patient. This is shared decision making, but based on these recommendations. Then the patients are always asking this very important question. Is there anything I can do from a holistic perspective to be better? And of course, there are lots of things we can do. I'm going to quote a few and move forward. This is really the five, last five minutes of my talk. You know that cardiovascular risk is very high in sexuality. We had a beautiful paper in the Lancet. This is 22 million people in the UK. It shows that the risk of cardiovascular manifestations is multiplied by three in SLE compared to match control. So this is very high. We know that the risk of infection is really high. And my advice is that we should be very careful about the doses of corticosteroids that we use. We should really minimize as much as we can the amount of corticosteroids we use. Just as a reminder, we have data in rheumatoid arthritis, one milligram increase in the dose of prednisone increases by 10% the risk of severe infection. Bone health is crucial. Just remind reminder that we, we are recommending photoprotection to our patients. So they all have vitamin D deficiency. We have to substitute this. And I want to conclude with something. I don't know if you know about that but it is the gynecological screening. The patients will see so many doctors, they often forget to go and see their gynecologist. And the risk of high-grade cervical dysplasia is strongly increased in SLE, so the patient should have the gynecological follow-up performed properly. Photoprotection should be recommended. According to me, it should be prescribed. I put it on the prescription sunscreen, full protection with 50 plus FPS. And this is a good way to be sure that the pharmacist is going to try to sell some sunscreen to the patient. Uh, and we'll talk about photoprotection. Smoking cessation is super important. It strongly decreases response to treatment. Just to take hydroxychloroquine, efficacy divided by two in smokers to compare to non-smokers. We should promote physical activity. I'm leading an international task force about physical activity in SLE. These are just a few ideas, but we are working on it. Obviously, beware of the sun. Obviously, do not jump on joints that are inflamed. Be careful about patients with anticoagulants. They cannot jump uh, from a parachute or do skydiving. It's really important to be careful. And we have one manifestation that is left, which is fatigue, that is really difficult to manage. With uh, Philippe Mertz from my team, we've been really thinking about that, Lukoka also, and we've been deriving some strategies to cope with fatigue in SLE. You can download the paper for free if you're interested. It will be really helpful. I just want to conclude about uh, digital medicine because there are lots of things we are still doing not so well, and I think digital medicine can help, especially in tracking the PROs. Patient can answer questions every day when they want, and we can be provided with this feedback during the consultation. So this is really my conclusion. We need to treat to target and to target remission, to prevent the risk of lupus flare, to prevent the risk of damage. And for that, we need to give hydroxychloroquine to all our patients. Corticosteroids are very important, but we have to be very careful and to use immunosuppressive agents or biologics when needed, not too early, not too late. There's a huge thing about the management of comorbidities, about pregnancy and fertility, but also about monitoring, especially for the eyes. And it is so crucial to conclude about all the lifestyle interventions we can do to get our patients go better. If you are not members of the European Lupus Society, I'm the president, so I'm making small advice. Uh, you can go on the website and subscribe. 
you have the opportunity to be invited to the workshops we organize for free. So this is the sleuro.org. Check it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, also for this fascinating, uh, fascinating webinar and also about anapatterns.org. I saved that aside for myself. And I wanted to also remind the chat that you have the opportunity to ask Q and A's. If you see at the bottom of your screen on the right hand corner, there's a Q and A, you can type your questions there. And we have also several questions. Uh, and the first one is, do you have any data about tongue hyperpigmentation in SLE? So not really, I would check that it's not fungal in case it is black, for instance. But what I can say is that the word hyperpigmentation really relates to side effects of hydroxychloroquine, especially in patients taking aspirin or anticoagulants. The bruising can turn into pigmentation. It can be very bothering on the legs, especially in young women. But you can also see this on the palate. So this is definitely something to check out. I usually check the blood levels but uh, it may be a reason for stopping hydroxychloroquine in some cases. Okay, thank you. We've got another question about, uh, is there a, any a SLE with ANA negative? Yeah, it, it is a great question and it's a very practical question. I'd say yes and no. Of course, there are papers about ANA negative lupus in around let's say 5% of cases. I think the important message is that if you have no ANA, this is very strong against the diagnosis, especially in the ICU, no ANA is not going to be lupus. If you have a strong doubt, it is always great to double check, but you need to have a strong clinical doubt. As I said before, the kits that are used in the laboratory, they have different sensitivities, different specificities, and there is a huge variability Sometimes it can be negative somewhere, positive elsewhere. What I would say is that most of our true lupus patients, they have ANA antibodies at high titers, 320, 640 or more. Uh, thank you. And the next question is, how do you approach persistent cytopenia in otherwise clinically quiescent SLA patients? Oh, this is a great question. Cytopenia is very common. I'd say it depends upon the type of cytopenia. If it is a minor neutro neutropenia, it's quite okay. Lymphopenia is very, very common, and it can be very deep. And it is very uncommonly associated with um, um, infection with gerondesi, for instance. So I, I, I'm not worried about that. It's not the same for thrombocytopenia when it is below the usual thresholds, 30 uh, gig or, or 50 giga, depending on the context. But for minor cytopenia, minor lymphopenia, I would not do anything else, actually. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, another two questions. Uh, does children lupus have a specific histological findings as immunofluorescence? Uh, mm -hmm. Any help? Yeah, it's a great question. So it can be difficult to distinguish children. So it's cold exposure with lupus children. As the name says, lupus children, the histology is typical of systemic lupus. So if you have it up, you can make a biopsy. Also, that is. A difference is that chilblain is due to cold exposure. Lupus chilblain usually stays outside of the cold period. Uh, thank you. The next question is how to make histological difference between acute cutaneous lupus and dermatomyositis? Oh, that is a very, very difficult question. Uh, my guess is that the person asking the question is a high level doctor because it can be very similar. Well, there are slight differences, especially regarding mucine deposition. So you can always ask for this, but it can be very difficult. And this is where the concentration between the clinics and the pathology is very useful. Usually skin lesions of the M are quite different from those of systemic lupus, a bit mirror-like in the topography, for instance. It's confrontation that matters. And of course, having SLE-specific antibodies increases the likelihood that it's going to be SLE. Yeah, 
Okay, uh, there's another one. Uh, SOE patients with post with high positive LA without APL, does everyone need to add aspirin? Okay, uh, great question. Again, there are some clear recommendations for the primary prevention, and I know that quite well because there are two big meta analyses, and I'm the author of both. Uh, patients with lupus anticoagulant, well, they have antiphospholipid antibodies. That has to be clearly said. And among all factors, this is the one that increases the most the risk of first thrombosis. So the answer is yes, unless contraindicated SLE patients with lupus anticoagulant should receive a primary prophylaxis with low dose aspirin. Thank you. The, there are quite a lot of questions right now posted. The next one is, what is your opinion on long-term immunosuppressive treatment with Belimumab? Okay, I hope we don't have someone from a pharmaceutical company being anonymous and asking the question. What I can say for Belimumab is that we have some long-term data from long-term extension studies and real-life data, and the drug is well-tolerated. It's difficult to know if the efficacy is maintained because in the long-term extension studies, many patients leave the study for different reasons to what the patients remaining are likely to be enriched in patients with efficacy. But the tolerance profile, especially for infection, is very favorable. Thank you. Uh, another one, what about known genomic effect of uh, intravenous pulses of glucocorticoids in active lupus nephritis? Is the right for then reach the taprint glucocorticoid in a long period? Okay, so glucocorticoid, they work by connecting to a cytosol receptor, which binds to DNA. This is called genomic effects. And when you use high doses with pulses, you trigger non-genomic effects modulating channel calcium, things like that. Um, the literature is very, very poor. If you look at what is published on non-genomic effect of corticosteroids, it is not good literature. So I, I cannot say that we have a proof that it works well to spare corticosteroids. This has to be proven prospectively, and for now is not the case. Thank you. The next one is, is there a difference between IgA, IgM, yes. or IgG double-strand DNA antibodies for SLA diagnosis? Yes, DNAs, anti-DNS antibodies we are taking into account are IgG antibodies. The other ones that are less important. Okay, another one. Can stop corticosteroids after 35 years of use having negative, uh, uh, I'm sorry, have negative consequences for the body? Um, Belimumab is used, but C3 and C4 remain slow. Uh, I suppose it's a clinical case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just to say stopping corticosteroids. Well, if you've been taking corticosteroids for 35 years, it's probably time to discuss whether it's possible to stop it. I just want to remind everybody that long-term exposure to corticosteroids may induce adrenal failure. So it is definitely recommended to stop very slowly and to test function if um, it's feasible for you. The next one, how much common is the liver involvement in SLE? Because sometimes autoimmune hepatitis mimics SLE. Yes, historically people were talking about um, Lupoid hepatitis, I think most of these patients are now reclassified as um, an autoimmune hepatic disease. Uh, if you have some problems on the liver enzyme, it's definitely worth checking uh, these autoantibodies for hepatic autoimmune diseases. Uh, how frequent is acute cutaneous lupus without specific autoantibodies? Uh, uncommon. Acute systemic lupus is very strongly associated with systemic uh, lupus, more than 95% of, of cases, to the point that you do not treat the rash yourself, uh, it, itself, I'm sorry, you, you treat the flare of, uh, of underlying lupus, actually. Is there any clinical method to differentiate between annular erythema of Sjogren's and subacute cutaneous and SLE? No, I don't think so. Uh, basically, this is induced by SS antibodies. It's a very strong predictor. Don't know anything about a specific method. 
Okay, another clinical suppose. Have you ever had a patient who presents with lupus, all the antibodies, clinical symptoms, but turns antibody negative during treatment course? Of course, of course. Uh, there are different reasons for that. We're talking about autoantibodies and we use immunosuppressive drugs. So the levels can vary, they can go down. That's the first point. And some patients, well, maybe they can cure their lupus in a way, autoantibodies disappearing. I think everybody's following lupus patient has cases like that. People going much, much better, which is great, and disappearance of antibodies. The next one. Can severe thrombocytopenia happen in a patient known with SLE, but with concomitant negative ANAs, normal ESR, and normal C3, C4? Should we look for other causes for the thrombocytopenia? Okay, I think I already said in a way that when uh, ANA is negative, is unlikely to be systemic lupus, I would definitely search for another cause, actually. And did you add a trimetoprim sulfamentoxazole to all your patients who take prednisone, prednisolone greater than 20 milligrams a day? I don't, for two reasons. First, infection with uh, pneumocystis, uh, pneumocystis is very, very uncommon in, in cystinic lupus. Uh, there are a few papers published last year, but this is a very uncommon uh, epitomistic infection. The second point is that it's quite controversial. We think that Bactrim is a lupus-inducing drug, so you risk, in a way, theoretically, a flare. So I would definitely not do that. Uh when there is an eye toxicity, can we have an alternative for Plaquenil? Not really. So um, in this family of drugs, uh, antimalarials, you have uh, hydroxychloroquine. You have chloroquine, which is also contraindicated because the high toxicity is actually higher. And in France, it's not available anymore. We have mepocrine. So this is theoretical because we don't really have it in France but it does not work so well. It colors the skin yellow, so the tolerance is not so good. But theoretically, the answer is yes, mepocrine. Um, I just want to add something. In the pipeline of what is being under research in SLE, that like future drugs, most pharmaceutical companies are developing toll-like receptor uh, blockers, TLR7, TLR9, small molecules. And this is the main or one main mechanism of action of hydroxychloroquine. So I think that in the next few years, we're going to have some kind of new synthetic HCQ without eye toxicity. Okay, thank you. There's another question. I suppose it's referred to lupus and vasculitis and uh, if they are coexistent, if we could use uh, bilimumab in the both situations. Ah, lupus vasculitis. So actually, uh, lupus vas true lupus vasculitis is not so common. We are usually saying based on the skin, oh, this is vasculitis, but, but it's not. Um, when you look at, for instance, in the bilimumab studies, uh, there is a good efficacy on the vasculitis domain, yes. Thank you. Uh, next question, for transfer, uh, transverse myelitis, which is your main recommendation? Yeah, it's a very difficult manifestation. I would definitely use some immunosuppressive agents, but also some aspirin, actually. And, and check a APL. Another one, do you consider useful collect complement levels from the early stage of disease together with the NTDS DNA titers is useful for evaluating the risk of flares and what are the evidence about the C3 levels and the risk of flare in lupus nephritis or on systemic lupus? Yes, of, of course, of course we should follow C3 levels and DSDNA antibody titers. Uh, this is actually what I prescribe to the patient for the follow-up. I have a very simple prescription, just routine lab plus C3 plus DSDNA antibodies. When the C3 goes down and the DSDNA goes up, well, a flare may be coming. And just to anticipate the next question, we do not change the treatment preemptively based on the changes. We wait for clinical manifestation. Thank you. I also have a question regarding biological medic medications. Is it possible or in the future, will it be possible to combine two or more biological medications, for example, rituximab and belimumab, just for complete blocking of B lymphocytes? Of course, uh, this is a great question. We, we are looking for new strategies to treat SLE. 
And it can be completely new drugs or combining drugs we already have or other strategies. And actually, you know that when you give rituximab, there is a peak of bliss. It's logical. You deplete the B cells, so the body makes bliss, which is the stimulator for B cells. So on top, you can have bilimumab. There are four randomized controlled studies. One uh, phase three is actually negative, and there is one phase two that has been published uh, last year or the year before, which is positive, showing a decrease in DSDN antibodies and a reduced risk of severe flare. So it is an option. Okay, another question in the same line as curious ones. How often do you recheck C3, C4 and uh, DNA, uh, DNA in your patients? I do that usually every three months. And it looks like that's it. Thank you, Professor, also for this wonderful and very informative webinar. It is an immense pleasure. Uh, I, I wish you lots of good things to all of you. I have been very, very happy to share this hour with you discussing about the site clinical post. We definitely need to raise awareness for this rare disease. And I'm happy to see so many people being interested. So thank you very much uh, to FM and to uh, young internists. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Lucia. So now uh, we introduce uh, our chair, Catherine Delcia, that uh, she wants to um, show us some information about activities uh, from Young Internet. So, Katrina, your turn. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Arnaud for, for this really amazing presentation, for sharing his time and mostly his knowledge with us. Um, just like he mentioned before, if you are not following him on Twitter, please do. Uh, he always has amazing new information. Um, so it's very useful for us young internists, young rheumatologists, um, maybe even some, some patients that joined us um, today. Uh, I would also like to invite you to follow us, the Young Internists, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, because we will keep you updated with everything that is new that is happening and all the new projects that we have for you. And speaking of new projects, I would like to announce that uh, subscriptions for the European Summer School of Internal Medicine have begun. It is different for each country, how they select their representatives, but most countries that are part of EFIM will send one or two representatives to the summer school. So, So if you are interested, please contact your society and see how you can attend this year's summer school. And don't forget that FDIME, the Federation for Development of Internal Medicine, is also supporting bursaries for young internists coming from less wealthy countries. I would also like to announce our next webinar, which will be on the 19th of April in collaboration with the EFIM Ultrasound Working Group and Professor Juan Torres, who is actually the chair of the EFIM Ultrasound Working Group, will give us a talk on focus for the young internet. And last but not least, I would like to invite you to participate in our survey, the challenges in internal medicine training and residency. This is an ongoing survey that we have all over Europe. It has helped us already to develop new projects like the focus one, and it's helping us to identify common issues uh, that we share all over Europe, common challenges that we have, and it will also help us to develop new projects that can address these challenges that we are all going through uh, together, even though from, from such different backgrounds. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for participating to this webinar, and we really look forward to seeing you in our next one. And hopefully in the next webinar, we will also launch the Young Internist Scholarship. So please stay tuned and, and follow us for, for more updates. Thank you very much.